Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you folks this morning on this lovely, may I say, beautiful, summery August Lord's Day morning as we meet together again. What a privilege it is and to, to hear and read about the stories of uh, God's people having the opportunity now to meet back together and I think it's just uh, helping us to realize and to appreciate how much we mean to one another as part of the family of God and that we have a place of worship. And so uh, it helps us to take in, perhaps to a, a certain degree, more seriously, even the fellowship we have one with another and the appreciation that we have, uh, we can have one for another. <clears throat> And the reminder that we can pray for one another as well. Thank you for work, uh, the worship team for uh, beginning our service here this morning in a couple of songs of praise and uh, just a blessing to hear uh, those words and the music and just how our, our hearts are being prepared as we worship the Lord together. Uh, for a, a few prayer requests, at least one that I'm aware of is pray for Clarence. And Clarence is one of those who hasn't returned yet, but he is having a cataract, I believe, uh, uh -huh. surgery in the beginning of September, so we'll pray for him and others as well who have not returned and are not with us at this time, but nonetheless, we continue to bring them before the Lord in our prayers. And welcome for some of you who are back again for the first time, and welcome uh, Shelley, glad to have you again with us. And uh, Lorraine, we pray God's blessing upon you as well for your first time here. And for the rest of you, uh, well, again, it's good to have you uh, here uh, with us this morning. So uh, let's just look to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll uh, look at the Lord's word for uh, the next few moments. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with. And certainly, as this is the beginning of the week. We set it aside and, Lord, that you would not only prepare us for this day and speak to our hearts, but that we would be prepared moving forward from here and from this place of worship. That you would draw us closer to yourself. That would make a lasting impact and impression not only upon our hearts for your glory, but through us that you might use us this week. So, Lord, as we look into your word, that the eyes of our heart might be open to receive from you what you have in store for us. We pray for Clarence at this time and for others who are not here with us. We pray that you would just comfort and minister to them and counsel them where they may be. We pray for Clarence that uh, for this uh, cataract surgery, that it would be a success in restoring to him a measure of improved eyesight. Lord, we pray as well for the, all that you've blessed us with and the privilege we have of giving back a portion of all that you've given to us materially, temporally. And Lord, we do pray that you would grant us wisdom as you've entrusted to us to be good stewards with what you bless us with. So Lord, we thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as we continue the songs, or the songs of summer, we're on what kind of journey? Onward and upward. We're on an up, onward and upward journey. Sometimes it just feels like we're on an onward journey, doesn't it, in life? We're going nowhere fast. We're like the proverbial mouse just running around in a circular motion, accomplishing not a whole lot. However, the songs, the psalms are also songs. And the ones that we've considered so far in this collective group of psalms, which are songs of ascent, they seem to all have a theme. I trust this past week you've been content. Because that was the message, remember? Contentment? At least that's what it says in verse 2 of Psalm 131 in our song of Last week's uh, psalm, 
But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content, resting in the Lord. Resting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Learning to trust in Him, but rest in Him. And a couple of weeks ago, remember, we considered a song, what, uh, Psalm 126, another beautiful song, songs of ascent as we're going upward, we're drawing closer to the Lord as the pilgrims were moving uh, to Jerusalem in worship and singing these songs, hence uh, the title Songs of Ascent. A couple of weeks ago, Psalm 126, a song of restoration. Oh, isn't it? Wonderful to know how the Lord can restore us to himself. And so we notice these themes that we just pull out of the songs. The titles of the message and the themes are right in the songs themselves. We don't need to invent material. It's right there in front of us. So it is today. We're going to look at Psalm 130. So if you have your Bibles and with open hearts, Turn with me to Psalm 130. And this psalm here is one where it reminds us where the journey begins. The song, if we're going to have a song, what's the starting point? Well, the first four verses make for a wonderful title of this song. And what's the title of it? Out of the depth. Or in the Latin, De Profundis, as it was titled from about the 6th century on, which means out of the depths. In the Hebrew, it would be, uh, to be more complete, it would refer to the deep parts of the sea. Out of the depths of the sea. Ha! Huh. So what's the problem, you may be thinking? Our culture today, when we think of the sea, we think of sand, surf, sun, sailing, blue sky. But in ancient times, in biblical times, it wasn't quite like that. When they thought of the sea, it was this foreboding type of uh, restless, unpredictable, almost evil. And the sea didn't, you know, even as uh, this time of year, if you're watching those specialty networks, they always have uh, Shark Week. <laughs> and that's when I think of the sea, that's what I think of. I don't put my foot too deep in the sea whenever I go somewhere near an ocean. I see trouble. I can't see the bottom. I don't see what's going on, what's lurking underneath those waters. I try to steer clear and stay on the sand. However, sometimes we find ourselves in the sea. Because in this song here, Psalm 130, it's out of the depths. It's, of course, speaking of, the, the depths speak of a place of despair, a place of isolation and hopelessness. <laughs> what a song to sing. Mm -hmm. If I was to break this song down, I would have four stanzas. And between each stanza, I would be using as my chorus out of the depths. I would sing the first two verses. That would be my first stanza. Let's look together and read. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to my cry for mercy. When, as we begin this song, it has a starting place, and the starting place is out of the depths of despair. You see, this song, in this journey, begins with what? It begins with a, a plea. If we think of the way to get out of the depths of despair, Give me something material, tangible that I can do to build my way out. Is there a ladder? Is there a tunnel? Is there a tower? No. To get out of the depths is simply a plea away. It's simply a plea away. We want to complicate things. But this song tells us in verses 1 and 2, out of the, out of the depths, is a plea 
a way, a plea for mercy. In this difficult place, and in these depths, as we consider them, I notice I didn't say it's a prayer away. Yes, that's what this, uh, these first two verses convey, a, a petition away. But it's more than that. It's a plea away. Look, what he, look at the term he uses. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Someone has suggested that it's a lament. In other words, it's a cry. It's been suggested that we don't cry enough before the Lord. We don't weep before the Lord when we're in that place in the depths of despair. But there's a good thing about being in the, in the middle of the sea, at the bottom of the sea. There's only one way to look. That is up. That's the one good thing about being in the depths of despair. And every child of God could know that. There was a time in your life when you were at rock bottom and you had one place to look. When, all, when you had exhausted every other possible way to help yourself, you realized that I have to look up. Because someone had come along and told you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And someone had told you that God can be your help. That God can be your hope. That God can be your Savior through Jesus Christ. And you looked up. And God pulled you out of that place. That place of despair. You see, it's a cry for mercy. It's a cry, look what he says. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. Isn't it good to know that we have a God who not only hears, but we have a God who cares, who listens and desires to help. He longs to hear our weeping, lament, and cry to him. He is only a plea away, but what keeps us from that plea is our pride. God wants us. You know when you, sometimes you go downtown and you might see a beggar on the side there, and you kind of think to yourself, what? You might think, I'm glad I'm not like that. I'm glad I'm not begging for bread on the street or a few coins. But you see, God wants us all to be beggars before him, to make that plea, that lament, that cry to him. Sometimes we can get pretty puffed up after a while, and we know how to dot our eyes and cross our P's, doctrinally, theologically, and also in the way that we dress. However, God knows our hearts, and God knows that our hearts might be covered with pride, and we're no longer crying out to God as we once did. And that's one reason why we miss that sweet fellowship with Him. We started to rely upon ourselves in our Christian life. Well, this is... This begins, God is only a plea away in this journey. So that's the first stanza. Now we go back to the chorus. Out of the depths. Out of the depths what? Not only is he a plea away, there is great pardon available. There is a pardon available. It's a plea for mercy, but it doesn't end there. If we read the next two verses, then our next stanza, look what it says. If you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? Who could stand? No, that's the answer. If God kept a record of our sins, we're all guilty before him. If God's keeping a record of your sins right now, you're all guilty before him. And we are. We, we have no hope and no help in ourselves because this speaks about what? There's a pardon available, but in the ver verse 3, part A, what does it say? If God kept a record of sins, listen, we're hopeless and we're helpless and we're eternally separated from him. You know that word sins isn't really part of our vocabulary today. And in fact, within some circles, people would mock at that, that language, that term, that reference. Sin. But we're still a sinful people. Listen, we all have that virus 
No, no, not COVID-19 virus, the sin virus. And that sin virus separates us from a holy God. That term there, stand, Lord, who could stand, is a judicial term. In other words, standing before the holy court of God. We couldn't. We would wilt away. We would wither away. We would be banished from God's kingdom forever. However, look at verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness. So that we can with reverence serve you. A pardon is available. It's recognizing the God's holiness and we can't stand before you. So therefore, we're crying for mercy. We're crying for mercy because we need forgiveness. And so, this is the heart of the gospel message. The grace of God is that it's a pardon available by grace that God God accepts us, not in our own merit or according to our own goodness, but according to His love. His Son who bore our sins in His own body, that He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. To be declared righteous before a holy God is just His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. And so as we, we see this wonderful, wonderful promise. It also helps us to understand this song. You see, this song is in the collection of what? Songs. But it's also in another collection as well. The penitential songs. This is one of them. Our more familiar one, or most well-known one, is probably Psalm, 1, Psalm 51, excuse me, that, uh, that great confession uh, of sin and repentance by David. How, and there's seven of them, and this is one of them in that collection. So undoubtedly, this was a confession of sin. Certainly there are different times in which we find ourselves in such despair. But this one was self-induced. This one was self-induced by a behavior, actions that were sinful, that the, the Indian, we don't know who the writer of this song is, if only we did, but perhaps, you know what, it's left blank that there's no name so you and I can fill in our own name. And sometimes I believe God's word does that on purpose so that we can personalize it. I've been there in that place of despair, but I also, and I also know that before a holy God, I don't deserve, I don't deserve a part but it's based upon His grace that there's forgiveness available through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, can you sing with me the chorus? No, we can't do the <laughs> Now we're getting to it. Okay. So, thirdly, this third stanza here, verses five and six. The journey out of the depths of the sea. The journey onward and upward moving closer to God continues with what? Well, you know, for you and I, perhaps from uh, our journey of God pulling us out of the depths and, he, and the Lord continue to, to, continues to do that because, you know, we're prone to wander. We're prone to wander into the deep seas and begin to sink. And so, um, when God pulls us up, you know what the problem is sometimes? Say, Lord, thank you. Just make everything the way it was. <laughs> you know? And yet sometimes we have to recognize we reap the consequences of our wrong decisions, of our sinful behavior, and even though in God's grace He's forgiven us, and even though in God's grace He's pulled us out of the depths, and even though in God's grace we've begun that journey onward and upward, you know what we need? Along the backpack of the spiritual journey is something called patience. Patience. And, and that's acknowledged and acted upon. 
patience. In the next two verses, verses 5 and 6, you will read one word five times. What is that word? Class. Wait. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. Wait. Patience. The journey requires patience. But there's two ways here that are, uh, are that's impressed upon our hearts in how we should wait. I said patience, acknowledging that patience is needed, but acting upon it. There's two ways in which, in which we act upon waiting upon the Lord, exercising patience. He delivers us, but he's continuing to deliver us from day to day to day. And sometimes we just don't see it the way we wish we, we could. Or, or we don't see the Lord answering our prayers the way we hoped. And, and the Lord's not getting rid of all of our problems or issues or struggles of life how we would wish or hope for or pray, even pray about. But the, the song is here in this song is saying, wait, wait, wait in two ways. What's one way to wait? Wait with the word. What does he say? I waited for the Lord. My oh yeah, my whole being. <laughs> you know, sometimes just a part of us likes to wait for the Lord. This means perhaps your Bible says your soul. Mm -hmm. That's your whole being. Your 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 whole being. Your your intellect, your emotions, your will. Everything about you that makes you up, uh, I'm going to wait. Because sometimes intellectually, i got to wait. But emotionally and, and in my will, I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm not waiting. However, one way that we learn to wait is we don't forsake the word of God. Look what he says. And in his word, I put my hope. I put my hope. God's word has to be our meat and potatoes. Our God's word teaches us to wait. The song, the psalmist, in another passage, in another psalm, said, "He counsels me. He counsels me, and afterward he'll take me to glory." But God's word counsels us. God's word comforts us. God's word reveals his will to us. God's word gives us a spiritual ability to wait upon him. I just want to read this to you because I received an email last week or the week before about uh, sending an article to um, the local paper and oftentimes we have an insert about people's church and I provide a devotional. And lately we haven't because the paper has only been online. Um, so the way that it was worded to me in this question by email to the one who looks after the church part of it uh, for the, to make the insertions into the paper said, is there, at least let the people know that because of COVID things aren't happening. And I, the way it was worded, I just didn't feel, it didn't sit well with me. I thought, boy, that's, that sounds defeatist. That's a defeatist attitude. And, and so I just had to write these words. And I'll share them with you. If, you're going, if you go online for whatever article it is in the next couple of weeks or months, People's Church, de Montaigne. Jesus said, I will build my church. Even though COVID-19 has stopped, or put on hold much of what we took for granted or deemed as normal in society, we can rest assured that the virus has not limited or put on hold the plans and power of God. You see, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Put your hope in God. And that's how I conclude it. And then, of course, I put the little insert at the bottom. Regular service time. Continues on Sunday morning. We have a very careful COVID-19 protocol in the church. So there you go. But you see, the word of God doesn't change. It's far going to outlast COVID-19. And your life and my life here on earth, it is eternal, the word of God. We have to believe it receive it, and live by it and trust in it. 
And so this is how we wait. We don't just wait around like this. Lord, get me out of my problems. We need to do something. Somebody has put it this way. God's word will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from God's word. Uh -huh. And so may we be reminded about how precious and permanent God's word is, along with how powerful. Mm -hmm. Not only so, we're to wait with the word, and yes, we've got liberation, like the watchman as well. Look what he says next. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman. Wait for the morning. More than the watchman. Wait for the morning. Well, I don't know if any of you ever had the graveyard shift. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> because it, all you seem to be doing during the graveyard shift is waiting for morning. <laughs> You're just waiting for morning. Can you imagine a watchman? I suppose it's the watchman looking over and protecting the city. They would be on the walls, high up, looking to see if there be any intruders, invaders, any enemy, and they would be overlooked. But you know how difficult it is? You're straining your eyes, you're trying to see. It's difficult, more difficult, than doing uh, the, the watchman, having the watchman shift during the daytime. So what's the watchman doing? I'm looking forward to the day. I'm looking forward to the dawn. I'm tired of the night and the darkness. I want the dawn. You see, as watchmen, more than watchmen, we look with anticipation. Mm -hmm. We don't just glibly wait. We're, 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 we're watching with God's word. We're watching with great anticipation God's time, and he's going to deliver us in his time. As I was uh, visiting with Richard the other day, and I was, we were talking about, I don't know, a million Topics. We solved the world's problems, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a cup of coffee and uh, an open Bible canoe. But nonetheless, uh, we're talking about how we approach life and the consummation of all things. Ultimately, God will deliver his people. You see, we look at time as a distant future. If that little uh, step right there represented the consummation of all things, how we look at time is wrong. You know why? Because we look at time as a distant future. We look at time like this. Oh, there's God's coming back. Oh, wait there. And we keep pushing it off and pushing it off. And it's been 2,000 years. So maybe God isn't coming back as he promised. There is no deliverance for his people. Wrong approach. From now on, this is how I suggest we look at the consummation of all things. We don't look at it as a distant future, but we look at it this way. There's the press, right? We're walking parallel with the consummation. We don't know when it's going to happen. And that's why the first generation of believers believed that God was going to return at that time. They weren't foolish, but they lived as though when it happened, it could happen at any time. Not this distant Oh, it's 2,000 years from yet. It's going to be another 2,000. We don't know. We walk parallel with eternity. It can happen at any time when Jesus comes back and receives his church to himself. And so we need to be reminded of that. Today might be the day. I haven't received a vision that it is, but it could be. <laughs> so we, we, we wait. We patiently acknowledge but we act upon what waiting means. And there's so many ways in which we can talk about deliverance. And I recognize that that's talking about deliverance in the ultimate sense. But even uh, from the darkness, from that place of being in the depths, all of a sudden, God's light shines in and brings us through that difficult time. In his point, in his way, but it requires patience. And finally, let me hear the chorus. <laughs> Israel, put your hope in them. You see, all of a sudden, this has been a personal uh, testimony for the first six verses, but yet now it becomes a public appeal. All of a sudden, he knows what God has done for him, this psalmist. Now, what's, what is he going to say? 
I've got good news. Israel, I've got good news. Put your hope in the Lord. Why? Let's not forget God's loyal love to the nation of Israel. Let's not forget that there is redemption, a full pardon available. Let's not forget all of these things that in verse 8 it says, He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. He is making a plea to God's people. This reminds me so much of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9. The Apostle Paul, we know his story. We know his testimony in Acts as it's recorded in chapter 9. You turn to Romans chapter 9, he's converted to the Lord in Acts chapter 9. And in Romans chapter 9, Paul just can't contain himself. He says this, I speak the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience confirms that through the Holy Spirit, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for what? For who? For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the Israelites. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be safe. And so, as we read through other prophecies, Zechariah 13, 1, and Romans chapter 11 and verse 26, there will be ultimate deliverance. But we see the heart of those who were delivered, who have experienced. Now, they become, uh, now it becomes a public appeal for them to warn and tell others, to reach out. And so as we think of our own situation and circumstances, where do you find yourself? In what part of this song? In the first two stanzas? In the second two uh, verses? Or the second stanza, excuse me? Or the third stanza? Or the fourth stanza? Make that appeal to others. A song of ascent out of the depths. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for all that you blessed us with in Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, you would know in my own hearts how often I take it for granted your grace, mercy, forgiveness. And in all of our hearts, Lord, perhaps here this morning, you're reminding us to be as beggars pleading for us and not forgetting your matchless, marvelous grace that has pulled us out of the depths of despair. And you have delivered us, O oh Lord, and me in your grace, may we make that appeal to others. That others might put their place their faith and their hope and their trust in Jesus Christ in these days and times. So Lord, we, we ask that you would guide us as we trust in you this week. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you.